please welcome Washington Times opinion editor Charles Hurt. Thank you all very much. Um, thanks for having us, and thanks for having me. Uh, it is true, I am a member of the media, and uh, on behalf of my profession, I would like to say I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I am part of uh, the, the Washington Times. We're the, we're the good times, at least outside of the Beltway. In Washington, of course, we're part of the bad times. Uh, but if you care about, uh, as I, th I know everybody in this room does, uh, family, faith, freedom, and of course federalism, then uh, the Washington Times is a good place to go uh, for all of that uh, kind of coverage. We are not fake news. Um, I, I want to get uh, our, our esteemed panel here to introduce themselves, but I wanted to start by just kind of mentioning what this panel is about. Um, we all know uh, from last year's election uh, that stunned everybody inside the Beltway and everybody in the, in the uh, newspaper business or the media business. Uh, and the reason was because they think that politics is all about something and the rest of America knows it's all about something else. And whether you agree with Donald Trump or like Donald Trump or voted for Donald Trump in the primary or in the general, he tapped into something that none of those people had any inkling about, and he rode those issues into the White House despite all odds. And I think that what that highlights is just how big the chasm is between that place, the swamp, and this place, America. And the more that we can do to figure out how great people like you, great uh, legislators like these people to tell people in Washington, no, this is the problem and this is how we're going to fix it, the better off we'll be. In fact, I would say it is our only hope. It's the only way we're going to get out of the mess that we're in. So that's what we want to talk about. Uh, but let's I'd like to begin by having everybody introduce themselves and then we'll uh, kick it off from there. Good afternoon, my name is Ellen Troxclair and I serve on the City Council in Austin, Texas. I know that might be shocking to a lot of you <laughs> that there is in fact a conservative that serves on the City Council in an incredibly progressive city of Austin, what Rick Perry likes to call the blueberry in the tomato soup. <laughs> I, I ran for office because there was no one on the city council that was representing my views, certainly no one that was uh, fighting for lower property taxes or protecting my individual liberties. But increasingly, it has become more local governments are the battlegrounds to which the left are looking to fight the battles that they can't win at the White House or on the state level. So even though I'm the only conservative on a 10-member, 11-member council, uh, I am going to continue to fight for the freedom of not only Austinites, but just to be the voice for those people who don't have anybody else to turn to at the local level. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Isaac Latterell. I'm a state representative from the great state of South Dakota, which I hope you all move to uh, very soon, because we're trying to do some good things there. But um, I wanted to thank you all for having me here today, and also just thank you guys for being the ones who are really the ones pushing things forward. Um, I actually got into politics on accident after college. There was a state uh, legislator in my district and into my party who just didn't share my values, and it was the pro-life issue actually that got me to say, I need to step outside of my comfort zone and do something about this. And that's what really what brought me into it. And the longer I've been in, I've been in five years now, I understand that it isn't even about us really in the positions fighting the battles, but it's about what you're doing. You are the backbone of the change that we need. And the more that we do on the local level, uh, the more that we can see things going the way we want with freedom and expanding opportunity. Well, good afternoon. My name is Perry Buck. <laughs> I am just honored uh, to be here and uh, want to thank Alec and the Western Conservative Summit. But more than anything, thank you all so much from, uh, for descending here in the state of Colorado and, and, and you local people. Thank you so much for being a part of a, a wonderful, wonderful conservative movement. Um, I, was, um, I represent House District 49. I'm the minority whip. And uh, 
I would say that I never dreamed that I would have been in politics either. Um, my predecessor was drawn out of her district, and uh, the district is quite wild. Um, it's all of Larimer County, and except the city of Fort Collins and except the city of Loveland, it includes the township of, of Windsor. And I remember uh, my role, which I truly loved, was working as the cheerleader, the support role, uh, whether it was the state GOP or whether it's uh, 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 Colorado Republican uh, women. So. I never dreamed I would see myself in politics uh, either, um, but my mother was on the school board, my father was uh, county commissioner, and he was legislature, and then many of you know my hero, Ken Buck, who, uh, <laughs> and, and more than anything, I think if you have that conviction and you have those principles in your hearts of hearts and you've got it in your spine, you can do what's best um, for the state of Colorado. So thank you again so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Owen Hill down in uh, Colorado Springs. I'm one of 35 state senators out here in Colorado. And I, I moved out here from the East Coast. Uh, I went to that school for troubled youth down in Colorado Springs that some people refer to as the Air Force Academy. Uh, I, but I met a local gal and fell in love with her. But, but part of what I fell in love with about the West, about Colorado in particular, is there's a, there's a sense of, there's an energy. There's a desire to try new ideas, to continue to, uh, we have pioneers out here that made a living in a place with very little water, very little arable land, and, and they're, they've created a thriving place uh, that we've all come to and we're enjoying today. And that energy still exists. Uh, I think it's, a, it, it's channeling into a federalist energy, an energy that says we don't need D.C. to tell us what to do. We agree with the results of that sometimes. Maybe we disagree with it sometimes. But I really do believe it's up to us as conservatives now to, to pick up that energy and to say, how do we put forth these ideas, not just to champion the ideas, but find ways to make them happen here at the local level. So, Alan, I would like to uh, start with you. Um, you know, one of the uh, uh, free market success stories that we've seen over the last uh, uh, decade or so has been, whether you like it or not, Uber, uh, and it has and it has toppled the old uh, monopoly, government monopoly of taxi systems and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you have an interesting story about uh, Uber and Lyft uh, trying to uh, get into uh, Austin. T t tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, the internet and the smartphone has connected people like never before and enabled all kinds of ride-sharing services like Uber and Lyft. They were operating happily, actually, in Austin up until about a year and a half ago when the city came in and passed very onerous regulations that caused them to leave town pretty much overnight. Um, and, you know, in the aftermath, I really, it has really come to be such an amazing example of why of how difficult it is when government stands in the way of innovation, and not just the short-term cost, but the long-term cost, not only to us as individuals, but to our society as a whole. You know, overnight, about 10,000 people lost their jobs, the drivers who depended, of course, on Uber and Lyft to make their income. Uh, I had a restaurant owner tell me that their profits went down about 25% because people weren't ordering that second glass of wine because they didn't have a safe ride home, or worse, the people who were ordering that second glass of wine were getting in their cars anyway. Uh, but long term, it's been a year and a half now, and ultimately the state came in and passed a preemptive law that put in place a reasonable regulatory statewide framework, and Uber and Lyft returned to Austin. You know, during, the time, during their absence, our mayor consistently said, government is just innovating too fast for these private sector companies. And I just, I can't get over it because of how it demonstrates the extreme misunderstanding of the intersection between government and innovation. Not to mention the arrogance. <laughs> exactly. So what did, what did, in that year and a half, there was a nonprofit that the government uh, happily supported that spent millions and millions of dollars to create basically a, 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 ri a ride-sharing platform um, just like Uber and Lyft were, not, not even as good. So they spent, this money that was spent during that time was spent to do something that the private sector was already doing on its own. Instead of, I don't know, helping the homeless or providing free rides to elderly who need to go to doctor's appointments, 
that kind of thing just really bothers me as, you know, as a free market conservative. When I see that kind of waste, I know that we have so much need and I see government trying to replace the role of the private sector. And ultimately, you know, I think it's a, it, when, when government gets in the way of innovation, not only does it damage ourselves, our families, our ability to provide jobs um, and to contribute to our economy, but just think of where we could be if government hadn't gotten in the way year over year, decade over decade. I mean, we were, Austin was trying to put ride sharing in, shove it into the government model of taxis, which is 100 years old. Um, and that's the problem. We never just, we can't, anticipate the new technology that's going to come about and instead of getting doing away with the old regulations and starting from scratch uh, we we, tr we try to just fit basically a square peg into a round hole and and as conservatives anywhere whether you're living in a city or living out in the country isn't there some lesson there to be learned about how you um, you, you know, you, you make freedom cool among, you know, urban hipsters or whatever. You know, it's, a, it's an entree, isn't it, to selling um, conservatism, freedom, to people that, that they claim to like freedom, but then when you, they open their mouths, you're like, what are you talking about? You've got, uh, you, Isaac, you, you have some experience with the uh, intersection of the government. And Absolutely. Um, I come from a background as a technology consultant. I'm helping businesses kind of use the innovating technologies to keep up with things and grow their business. And um, just what you talked about, Ellen, with the way that Uber has been a case study for showing how decentralized power and freedom and individual opportunity is really, it's creating so much success and so much freedom and prosperity. And as conservatives, I really think that we have to do a better job of connecting the dots on those things because it's a perfect example of our conservative philosophy of limited government and individual freedom um, leading to opportunity for people, as well as lowering costs, and we just need the government to get out of the way, and these it, things will happen. It's almost so much winning that we get tired of it, yeah. I, apparently. Definitely. Or at least, uh, at least the Austin city government was getting tired of it. Um, uh, earlier, uh, you know, in addition to uh, an intersection like this, uh, you also have the sort of more traditional areas where government screws things up in education, and Owen, you have a, a, a considerable uh, victory in terms of winning uh, equal funding for charter schools, which also, uh, and I love it because of course it threatens the government monop monopoly on, uh, on education and uh, puts the fear of God in them. Um, and t tell us a little bit about that. You know, we did have a, a huge bipartisan win this year, becoming the first state in the nation uh, to equally fund our public charter schools along with our traditional neighborhood schools. And it, it's not, it, it, was a, it was a huge win. So Colorado students, if you, one in seven Colorado students go to a public charter, if you add them all up together, it would be the biggest district in Colorado is public charters. But it wasn't good enough. We, we gotta ask ourselves, how did we get it done? It wasn't good enough just to say we're gonna bash the unions, although the unions were defenders of the status quo on that. It wasn't good enough just to say school choice or to put out a tweet or post something on Facebook. What empowered us to get that done, I, I believe, is 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Conservatives got involved and said, you know what, we don't need the unions to run a good school. We can start our own, do a better job, just like with Uber, just like with countless other areas. We have to build this from the ground up. We built good schools. We have conservatives on school boards. We have conservatives teaching. We have conservatives doing classical schools or trade schools. That is what actually paved the way, I believe, uh, for us to get in and, and then make that change in policy. We can prove to the world that conservative ideas work, but we have to get in and, and, and do that hard work first. You know, uh, Perry, I feel like one of the big uh, areas where Republicans dropped the ball uh, has been with the Obamacare repeal. Uh, everybody knows the, the line, you know, we uh, Republicans voted so many times to repeal Obamacare and then, and then when, uh, you know, back when President Obama w obviously was not going to sign it and then now we're in this situation now, it would, be, it would really be great uh, to, to get it through now that we have a president that will sign it. Um, but my, my bigger concern is actually a little bit beyond that. It's the fact that, um, that we didn't have a replacement plan in, in place uh, because the, you know, that, that was based on free market ideas, based on freedom. Uh, and, and the fact that we, 
you know, th that's where conservatives shine the most, is when we're coming up with innovative, outside-the-box ideas about things like that. And uh, I, I guess my, my question is, is both, you know, you know how much of a failing was that, and, and how do we, where do we go from here to sort of reown that innovative space? Um. I was very fortunate. I, can't, I really can't take credit because it's the people that are in the trenches. It's people in this room that really um, are in a profession like medicine. Um, I serve on ag and transportation, but I was able to carry some incredible um, um, health care. Um, and one of them is the telehealth. So that was a wonderful bipartisan bill that allows you uh, pretty soon to take your phone, put it over your heart, and send an EKG to Anschutz instead of driving that four hours to uh, get an update. Um, as well as um, I was part of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which allows doctors not to have to wait for the bureaucracy to be able to tr cross state lines to practice medicine. We have a lot of incredible specialists and a lot of rural areas, and so that was very helpful for the rural area. And this last uh, session, speaking of Obamacare, apparently, um, and I didn't know this, but a, a doctor friend of mine said, there uh, was a part of Obamacare that had direct primary care, and it was um, in the Obamacare. And someone came up and said, we need to allow direct primary care. And we have more direct primary care doctors in the state of Colorado than anywhere in the country. But we wanted to create a parameter so if Obamacare did dissolve, that we would have this direct primary care for these doctors. But it's kind of like what we've seen government do in education, the one size fits all and government knows best and they don't. And the same thing that they do in medicine. You're going to find this, you know, the, the, the talk of the single payer. That doesn't work. It's a bureaucracy. We want to allow these doctors to say, I want to go outside of insurance. I want my patient to be able to pay $50, $60 a month, like a conditioning type of spa, you know, where you can see that doctor as many times as you want because we have more chronic care patients that need to see doctors more frequently. And they wait instead of having to pay that high deductible, they're going to be able to see their doctor to get those you know, weekly visits. And so pa patients take a better care of themselves. But it's outside of insurance. Because as you know, there is so much bureaucracy for a doctor from the transcribing to the coding to the receptionist to the calling the insurance companies. They're, it's a disaster. And they're going to really mess up our health care if they keep government puts that bureaucracy on their backs. Charlie, can I push back a little bit on that? Because you said we don't have a plan in place. I, I believe we do have a plan in place. It's called freedom, right? We, we have rules, we have regulations, we have taxes. The conservatives believe we, believe we get those out of the way and we have millions of doctors and nurses, uh, pediatricians, uh, ambulance, uh, you know, EMTs, ambulance drivers, you name it. They want to solve the problem of pre-existing conditions. They want to solve, they've got great ideas for bringing down the cost of health care, for making it more accessible. Government is in the way and that's why I think we're also ticked off at what's going on in DC right now. When did we stop believing in freedom and say somehow we've got to pl replace rules, regulations and taxes with something different? Yeah. Uh, And, and of course, if there were more people and Republicans in Washington uh, with that mindset, I think that uh, they would have been a, a heck of a lot more prepared to to act today. Um, how, you know, the, part of the problem, though, of course, with in particular with health care, is that you know, for young people today, it, you know, free health care just sounds so great. I mean, I love free stuff; it's great. I mean, how do you how do you how do you win that? How do you win the fight? How do you make the argument to them? It is so shocking the number of millennials who come from Republican households who consider themselves socialists. <laughs> that, I mean, it is a scary and sobering statistic. And it's because, you know, Bernie Sanders makes it sound cool. You know, yeah, free everything. Who doesn't like that? What we need to be able to correctly articulate to, to my generation is that there is no free lunch. I mean, you, you think that that's such a... You, you've heard that a million times before, and yet somehow... It's so hateful. <laughs> Sorry? I said that you're so hateful. <laughs> so hateful. You know, that, that, it, that it comes from somewhere. And I, I hope that as, as these people grow up and, and have to enter the economy and go to start their own businesses or 
the example that you brought up earlier with the ri with the sharing economy, I mean, I think that that is a great way to reach out to this population who doesn't think it's cool to be a conservative. They don't think it's cool to be a conservative right now, but they do think it's cool to hop in a, a Lyft or an Uber or to rent to go to have a home to rent a home in another city and hang out there for a couple days in, instead of a hotel. And we need to demonstrate to them that those things are only possible because government is not in there shutting them down. Amen. And actually it's the conservatives that are allowing those businesses to thrive. And it, I think one of the ways we do that is by pointing to things like that have an, are an example of decentralization and how it works. And you can say to a person like that you were mentioning, um, you like Bernie Sanders, why do you like him? And say, well, I just don't want the power you know, in the hands of those few people and so on. And so they think that they're for Bernie or things like that because they want the power in their hands. That's the fundamental question in America right now is who decides. And what we're saying as conservatives is we want you to decide. And, you know, the, the question who decides, who rules, who all the, you know, the, the, these very fundamental basic questions that all of us have thought about and wondered and sort of, try, you know, run the entire rabbit hole back to the source of, uh, you know, where do our rights come from? <laughs> No, those questions never get asked on the other side. But I do think it's interesting. I, I have three young children, or one of them's getting ready to drive, start driving. Um, they, and believe it or not, I don't indoctrinate them. I don't, I try not to ever talk about politics with them, except for the time that I had to raise taxes on all of them. Uh, <laughs> but that was because they were in Detroit, in uh, DC public schools, and they, and they thought that they liked Barack Obama. Probably because um, they feel the pain early. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then redistribute their, their money among the other ones. Um, it didn't work out very well for my daughter, but my sons made out like bandits. Um, but, but I'm interested, I'm fascinated by uh, the books they read and the movies, the popular young movies that are out today, the, the, po the popular movies among young people today, like The Hunger Games and all the, these dystopian novels that, uh, that they're just transfixed by and they, they'll watch, do the whole series, and, and I don't know if you, if, I, I haven't really watched enough of them to uh, critique them, but they're basically about government that, you know, a, a force, a power that has taken over a society, and people lose all their freedom. I can't help but think that kids that love that stuff aren't going to grow up and be on our side. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, it, I, I heard that same uh, story just what you were saying as that Hunger Games and how government takes over and I do think it gives them a perspective that's probably better than us putting them in the kitchen and beating them down until they relent. Although I, I, I was amused after uh, Donald Trump won the White House uh, uh, 1984 by George Orwell sh skyrocketed to the top and it was all of these liberals like oh well, we're going to read this because this is all about our ideology and it's like man not only are you not very smart, you're also illiterate. Um, <laughs> what about, um, what, so going beyond healthcare for now, uh, what about tax reform? Uh, what is it, where do we go from here in terms of preparing our legislators in Washington to understanding what's important about uh, getting tax reform through? Charlie, I'm shocked that I, I can stand in line to buy my wife some perfume for Mother's Day. And while there's two people in front of me, I can apply for a credit card while standing in line. And by the time I get up there, I've got 25% off that bottle of perfume because I got the credit card and I've already got the application there. How is it that we can do that in five minutes? You can get a, a, a credit card uh, while you stand in line. But if you make, you, know, you have to spend months and months and months to do your taxes. I, let's start with some simple ideas. The simple idea was I want to be able to pull out my phone and say, come pick me up here. And it resulted in Uber. Why can't we do the same thing on taxes and say, you're making another, under $250,000. You play it you pay a flat 8, 9, 10%, whatever that number is, and you're done. You don't have to think about it. You send your check in, and it's over. It should be that simple. The private sector has those ideas. I, I think it's about time we turn some of those ideas over and say, can we outsource the IRS to people who have much better ideas? I'd like to, uh, go, go in no particular order, uh, just go through and, and just ask each of you directly um, if there was, if, if, you know, to give, what's one idea, if you could set all the Repub or all the legislators in Washington down and give them uh, one uh, great idea from your experience here, 
uh, that they could that they could make happen. You know, I mean, we're at a time right now where Republicans own all of Washington, uh, sensibly. Um, we ought to be able to get these things through. Uh, what what would those what, what would that idea or or a couple of ideas be? Well, for me, it's really about following the Constitution, and that doesn't mean the 3,000-page Constitution that we're operating under now. I would say I want every single Republican on our team to be somebody who's trying to return all of the power and decision-making back to the local states. Because if you're not doing that, that's the problem. That's what we're all discussing here, is that innovation only happens when people are free to innovate. And you can't make one-size-fits-all policy. Our founders knew that. And that's why they created the system of federalism that we enjoy today. So, I mean, that's why I've been working on the Article 5 movement, because I think we have to do something um, from our side to solve the problem, rather than actually tell them, here's an idea you guys need to do. I say, we're going to do it to them. But, but, but is there... Uh, at some point, I, I, I honestly start to wonder whether the federal government is just simply ungovernable, because I, I know everybody in this room agrees with you, but at, at some point, there has to be, the, the hammer has to come down, and, and for somebody like me, I, you know, obviously, Donald Trump is not a, I wouldn't call him an ideological conservative guy, but I liked him because he was a hammer that was going to smash things in Washington, and, uh, and I, you know, I, whether he's succeeding at that or not uh, is something we could debate, but but how do you drop that hammer today and make them realize it? Because even I think even a lot of Republicans sort of follow along with the idea that well, you know, the gov you know, the federal government is probably the best place to deal with this. Yeah. Well, just real briefly, um, Mark Meckler and Jim Demint spoke earlier that we have already 12 states in the way, and that's a way that we as the states can drop the hammer. Um, that's really all I can think of in terms of putting the pressure on them to start doing something different. Well, just a shameless plug, I would ask you all to read the book, Drain the Swamp by Ken Buck. <laughs> it's a good book. And as you see in the back of it, it does say uh, Article 5, but it also, there's, and, th then, and then the other point is just simplify the tax code. We don't need, uh, it, it, just like uh, Senator Owen said, it's just simplify it. It shouldn't be as difficult as it is. Charlie, I, it's easy to think that you can go to D.C. and implement these ideas, and I know they're great ideas that we all share around here, but there's actually a, a bigger idea that transcends that, and I think it's a recognition that we have a very diverse country. We have 50 states, and other than providing for the national defense, I don't think there's anything that Colorado can't do better than Washington, D.C. Amen. So, so give us the opportunity. For every single bill that comes up, for every single policy discussion, I don't want my folks in D.C. telling us how to solve health care. I want folks in D.C. saying, you know what? People in Colorado and California and Connecticut are going to solve health care. We're going to get the hell out of the way. So I think federalism is the idea that transcends these other ones we're talking about. And, you know, we didn't get to this mass of federal government that we have today overnight, and I don't think that we're going to be able, able to reduce it overnight as well. So as much as we want to stand up here and say, uh, hey, it's so easy, just do it. I mean, the reality is, is that it's incredibly complicated. There are so many agencies. There's so much bureaucratic power. But I think one way to start is to possibly even consider putting a, putting a moratorium on new legislation. I want, I want my federal representatives to focus on getting rid of the regulations that have piled up decade over decade over decade. Um, set a goal, you know, try to do one a week. Try to look, try to go through one agency a month um, and, and look at what you can do to return power, return power to the state. So that would be a good place to start. And it, it, it does seem to me that it's always in the complicated stuff where they say, oh, it's so complicated. That's where the problem always comes. That's where the swamp kind of uh, f fills in whether you're talking about taxes, and you're exactly right, they're just, it's absurd, or you're talking about, uh, you know, over regulation. Uh, I, I, one of the things I know in Virginia that uh, where I'm from, uh, one of the things that the, the rules that they have in the legislature is that, uh, you know, every, you can only have a single issue, every vote bill you vote on can only be about one thing, and it can't be one of these massive sprawling things that are, you know, that's that tall and no one reads it. Um, and which is, of course, where everybody gets their little uh, goodies. We've got uh, a little bit over a, a minute uh, left here, and uh, but I wanted to go down. First of all, thank you, thank you all very much uh, for for being here. Thank each of you all for for uh, participating. Uh, but just if you had a clo closing comment, uh, uh, we've got about a minute left. 
Sure, I'll start and just say that I know so many of you in the audience have really good local elected officials and I want to help them. I'm the national chair of the American City County Exchange, ACE. Um, and this is a resource, it's a group that helps to support local elected officials, city or county, that seek to promote limited government and individual liberty. So at the local level, there is such a lack of resources and a lack of support. So if you know anybody that you can put me in touch with, please do that. I would love to introduce them to the organization. Yeah, and I just want to thank you all for being here and being involved. Um, get yourself educated on those technology policy issues, at least to the point where you can connect that between freedom and the conservative philosophy and the success that we've seen in the internet. And so thank you all for being involved and just good luck with you, what you're doing out there. Well, and I just want to thank you again all for being here. I believe this is a statement that this is one of the largest. I think Alec had one of the largest turnouts. And more than anything, never, ever, ever give up. Stay in the fight and never give up. Amen. Sure, real quick, I think it's important for us to recognize that a lot of folks are throwing this Trump temper tantrum, and that's leading, I've talked to some of uh, our local folks who are seeing lines out the door applying for uh, the fire protection districts, library boards. There is a return to federalism, and it's important for us conservatives not to get outflanked on that, to allow them to take over tons of these local spots. So I think every one of us needs to do what a good friend of mine, Julia Keywood, has done. She's on the Inglewood Budget Committee and said, here's my chance to give back a little bit and stay involved and promote these ideas. So we've got to make sure liberals don't outflank us on this, and we own federalism for the conservative. And freedom. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And all. Thank all of you all.